Hello, welcome to our workshop at Virtual PyCon 2020. This workshop is how to build a distributed serverless application. I'm Charlie Engelke. I'm a developer programs engineer for Google Cloud. That means I work on samples and examples on how to use various Google Cloud products, specifically serverless products. Uh, this workshop was built together with Lori White, who's a developer advocate also in Google Cloud, working with higher education. The slides and exercises for this can all be done on your own afterwards, even without following these uh, videos if you're interested. All of them are available at the website serverlessworkshop.dev. Feel free to share this with others even if they're not at Virtual PyCon. What we're going to do in this workshop is actually build a loosely coupled event-driven distributed serverless system today. So you're going to do this on your own laptops, get them ready. We're going to talk first about what we're going to build. And the idea here is we're going to create something to manage a programming contest. We'll talk a little bit about that more in detail. But the contestants are going to build things that play games. And we're going to use a very dumb game because we want to cover the concepts of how to build the application and use the environment less on how to create the logic of a good game player. But the same ideas could be used with other games and with other kinds of things other than games and programming contests. We're going to talk about what serverless is, what it means, and why it can be useful for this, describe the problem in a little bit more detail, and then talk about what our solution will look like, the general architecture, before we get deeper into it and hands-on. We'll then give an overview of the tool we're going to use, which is Google Cloud, primarily through the Google Cloud Console, uh, a website that you'll be able to work with hands-on. And then we're going to do the hands-on solutions. There are three main parts to the programming contest solution, and we have a separate hands-on code lab for each of those three parts. Finally, we'll finish with a bit of a recap. So if you're ready, let's go take a look. The game that we're going to be having the programming contest uh, players build is a number guessing game. We wanted to keep the simplest possible thing. So uh, the game will be asked to guess a number. It'll be given a lower and upper bound, and also it'll be given maybe a history of previous guesses. So the first time around it may ask, hey, guess a number from 10 to 50. And it'll come back and guess, uh, I don't know, 17. The next time through we'll say, guess a number from 10 to 50. You already guessed 17, but the answer is higher than that. The programming contest solution will come back and say, well, maybe it's 38 then. And then the next time through we'll say, guess a number from 10 to 50. Your previous guesses were 17, but the real answer is higher, and 38, but the real answer is lower. And we'll keep going until either the uh, program playing, uh, the, the game playing program comes up with the correct answer, or crashes, fails to answer at all, or in some cases, the judging system just gets tired of asking. We've asked you 100 times to guess a number and you still haven't guessed it, we're, we're not gonna ask anymore. The first thing we're going to do here is have you build and deploy the serverless guesser, the kind of thing a contestant would do. Then we're going to look at the overall system on how we actually judge the submissions, how we keep track of standings, how we authenticate users. All of that's going to be built in an entire contest judging and scoring system. That's going to involve multiple serverless components that are loosely connected via messaging. And we're going to keep persistent information in a no SQL data store. There'll be code labs for every part of the above. We're going to do this with serverless computing. And at this point, we always get some people bringing up the fact that there are still servers. And that's the case. Other people like to say there's no such thing as serverless computing. It's just other people's computers. Well, that's kind of true too, but that's the whole point of serverless computing. There are still servers. They're not your problem. They're the problem of the uh, infrastructure provider you're dealing with. In this case, it's going to be Google Cloud Platform. You don't have to provision them. You don't have to back them up. You don't have to manage them. You don't have to monitor them. You don't have to scale them. You don't have to do any of that stuff, which means going from figuring out what you want the software to do until you've actually got it deployed and running reliably is very, very quick compared to other solutions. Not only that, a lot of serverless options scale down to zero. So if you've got something that is often idle or has very bursty usage, you're only paying for the actual usage. And when that's not being used, you're paying little or nothing. 
There are a couple of major different flavors of serverless computing. A lot of them are based on using containers, where you create containers and the serverless platform manages scaling them, launching them as needed, replacing them when they're unhealthy, and so forth. The other flavor is fully managed. You just bring your application code, nothing else. The environments and all of that are managed by the platform. Managed serverless computing is what all of the solutions today are going to be built on. You're going to be responsible for the application code. Write your own programs. The cloud platform is going to handle everything else. Uh, keeping an up-to-date programming language environment, including all your programming libraries, keeping all the tools and APIs you need healthy, scaling your platform up or down, backing it up, all that kind of stuff is going to be handled by the platform. Your, one thing you need to remember, though, is that your code may be unloaded, reloaded, or loaded in multiple hosts at any time. So one thing that you may be used to doing when you build solutions is keeping track of state in memory or on disk. You're not going to be able to do that with serverless computing because there may be a lot of instances each with their own memory and their own disk, and you can't rely on them to know what you did on your last time through. You're going to have to keep any of that information externally to your software. And you also have to deal with the fact that sometimes when a new machine needs to be launched to run your serverless because you're scaling up or scaling from zero, there may be a little bit of startup latency. Although that's usually not too bad and every serverless platform works all the time to reduce it so that it's not going to be a problem in most cases. When we're talking about serverless computing, we're talking about software that has some common characteristics. It's got to be stateless, as I already mentioned. You're going to need to use an external data store if you need to keep track of anything from one invocation of your software to the next. It tends to consist of a lot of pieces loosely coupled. Each piece is going to handle one well-defined problem, and then when that problem's done, it's going to do something that may trigger other pieces to deal with other pieces, other parts of it. You don't have to sit there and think about every single piece you're writing as being the end-to-end -end solution, just dealing with one task. It's event-driven in most cases. So when something happens, like a web request coming in is a very common event, but perhaps somebody updates something in storage or sends a message, your software is going to be launched and run to handle that event. And it often relies on asynchronous communications. So unlike a web request, where the request comes in, the software deals with it, responds, and then goes away, often a message will come in or an event will happen, the software will deal with it, but nobody's waiting for it to finish. Whatever sent that message just relies on the fact that it'll be handled eventually. And when it goes and needs to deal with the result, it'll check to see if it's actually finished or not. It happens asynchronously, which means we've got a lot looser coupling among these components. So the problem we're going to solve today is that of a programming contest, the kind of thing that a high school or undergraduate program might run. A lot of you in your earlier days likely participated in programming contests. And the way they work is a bunch of programming problems are written up and they're given to the contestants to create their own solutions. And the problems tend to be, given this source file, do this kind of uh, calculation or processing and produce output, which we will then judge. We'll create a bunch of, as the judges, we're gonna create a bunch of different source files. We'll test your software against them and see if you produce the right output. Contestants write their own solutions. They test it with the sample data that's given out in the problem. And if they're really good, they actually write some additional sample data to test it, not just rely that they work on the simple cases. And then they turn the solutions in. In the early days, that was on physical media, like diskettes or CDs or uh, memory keys. Nowadays, it's probably going to be through email or uploading into a web form. Regardless, the judges get these solutions. They have to compile and run them against all their different test cases and then mark whether they succeeded or failed or crashed. And then there's another system that keeps track of all that and scores it based on when it was turned in and how many problems were solved correctly, that kind of thing. Contestants find out whether their submission worked or not. If it didn't, they can go ahead and try again. If you've ever worked on the judging side of this, you know that managing these submissions is a complete and total mess. You've got to keep track of what contestants submitted what solutions and when they were submitted, especially if physical media is involved, and you've got to avoid 
malicious code messing up your test beds. Uh, in fact, it's not even necessarily malicious code. It can just be dangerously buggy code that makes your test beds unreliable. And the next time you go to score a solution, it may fail, even though there's nothing wrong with that solution. It's the previous test has just left your system in a bad state. And you've also got to deal with different machine configurations. The so contestants may be running their stuff on different operating systems with different versions of your programming language or libraries or even totally different languages. You've got to have all of those on your own machines and match them up pretty well. The solution that we're going to use is to say, hey, it's hard to deal with submitted programs, so don't submit programs. Instead, after the contestant writes their program, have the contestant provide the infrastructure that the judge is going to use as well. We're going to run the solutions on the contestant's own infrastructure. When we look at how the problems are written, here's an input file, process it, and produce an output file. That's how HTTP requests works. So that's what we're going to do. The contestants will write their solutions and deploy them to a web server and just tell the judges, here's the URL. In order to test my assignment, take your input file and send it as a post request to my web server. My program will run and it'll return as its result. The, the, the return page or return data at any rate is going to be my solution to the problem. So if my program doesn't work or messes things up, as a contestant, I'm messing up my infrastructure, not the judge's infrastructure. The judges have a much easier job keeping track of stuff. And they can also hit that web server multiple times with all sorts of different scenarios and different uh, test files. They probably will want to randomize their test out a little bit so a contestant that can't figure out the solution doesn't end up just hard coding a response given an input file. So let's take a look at a high level system diagram. <coughs> the contestant is doing their work on their own laptop. After they get a solution that they think is correct, they deploy that solution to their own web server, which gives them a URL that's available to anybody on the internet. They submit that URL to the judging system, probably through a web form. The judging system then talks to that web server and does all the necessary testing and updates its standings and scores. And the contestant at any point can go look at the judging system standings page and see the status of all their submissions and how they stand relative to everybody else. We're going to build, first of all, the contestant solution. That's the smallest, easiest part of this overall problem. So we're going to get uh, a simple start to serverless computing using what we expect contestants to be able to do. We're then going to look at the bigger judging system, which has a lot more concepts that we need to apply on how we have multiple components interacting with one another to build a good serverless distributed solution. You've got to ask, if you've ever done programming contests, whether this is practical. You've got these contestants busily writing their solutions. Can we expect them to manage and deploy their own web servers as well? And if managing and deploying their own web servers means they provision and create a machine, put it on the internet, install web server software, configure each of their solutions as a different path in that web server, the answer to that is basically no. Programming contests are fairly short. Students are focused on just the problems. That's not going to work. But if they're using a lightweight managed serverless platform, it is very feasible, as we're going to see. It's not going to be a difficult hurdle for students to pass. In fact, the platform we're going to use for the students, for the contestants, is one that gives you the shortest possible path from something working on my machine to something deployed and running successfully on the internet. That's why we're going to start the workshop with that part of the problem. The contestant writes and deploys a solution to the web. Then we're going to get to the bigger system after that. We're going to use Google Cloud Platform. Well, that's what I, who I work for. That's what I'm most familiar with. But other cloud platforms could do all the same kind of thing. Any of the major cloud platforms has similar capabilities to the ones we're going to use on Google Cloud. Uh, the steps and details would be quite different. Uh, the effort involved would be somewhat different, but it still should be doable. All of our code for this workshop is on GitHub, and we're going to give you the URL in a minute. So feel free to fork that repository and adapt it to another platform and let us know. We'd be very interested. The resources you're going to need today are just a laptop with an internet connection and a modern web browser. Everything's going to be done through the web browser. You're not going to have to install any other software on your local laptop. 
Uh, you can use any modern standards-based web browser. Google Chrome, of course, will work, but so will Firefox, Safari, Edge, and probably some other browsers I don't even know about that are nevertheless modern and standards-based. You're also going to need a Google account. Now, if you've got a Google account through your university or work, what we call a G Suite account, it may well work. It can work, but the administrator of your overall university or company system can turn off this capability. So if you have any issues trying to use your work or, or school account, instead go ahead and set up a plain vanilla account, Gmail account, and use that for these examples. The materials are all online. The slides are at serverlessworkshop.dev slash slides.pdf. The source code's on GitHub at Google Cloud Platform, Serverless Game Contest, and the Code Labs, step-by-step -step instructions for each of the three sessions we're going to go through, are also available on serverlessworkshop.dev. So one thing to remember throughout this is that you can get the latest state of all the resources we're working with and share them with others as well if you want at serverlessworkshop.dev. So we can take a short break right now. And when you come back in the next part, we're going to go over how to get stuff up and running on Google Cloud Platform, and then we're going to solve the first part of the problem. The contestant writes a game playing solution and deploys it on the internet using a serverless tool. Thanks. Well, with that introduction out of the way, let's go ahead and start with the first hands on piece, the game player that each contestant will write. We're going to work with this hands-on and all the materials you're going to need are again available online at serverlessworkshop.dev. In order to do this work we're going to have to build a GCP project, a cloud platform project, and that's because all of the cloud platform resources live inside of a project. You've got one account and that one Google account can have many projects in it and you can share ownership of projects with other Google accounts. Resources in the same project usually can interact with one another, but you can enable resources in different projects to interact and you can also restrict resources in the same project from interacting. One of the nicest things about Google Cloud projects is that when you're done using a set of resources, you can just delete the project and all the resources go away. There's no chance of getting any future billing showing up by surprise. Now, in the real world, in this programming contest, each contestant would have their own project and the management system would be a separate project and probably the judging programs would be separate projects as well, all owned by different entities. But to keep things simple, we're going to just use one project for everything in the workshop. We're going to talk about when you might have to do extra work if they were in separate projects. It turns out there's not many places where that comes out to be an issue because of how we're architecting this system. We're going to do the work with the Google Cloud Developer Console. That's at cloud. Pardon me. That's at console.cloud.google.com. We're going to go and do that hands-on once we start the actual code lab. In that console, you'll need to build a new project. There's a drop-down at the top of the console where you select a new project. You click for the selection and click on new project rather than selecting an existing one. The system may already have created a dummy project for you and you can use that if you want. When you create the new project, you give it a name and you can call it anything. Uh, but its ID will probably be based on the name, but it won't exactly equal the name unless your name is globally unique across all of the cloud platform. So if you call your project serverless workshop, the project ID is probably going to turn out to be something like serverless workshop, some long random number. Uh, I tend to call my project something with my name at the beginning because it's pretty rare. So if you call the project Engel Key Serverless Workshop, well, you'd get a, a randomly selected number at the end of it because I've already done that. But I was able to get that name and ID coming out to be the same. One thing you need to be careful of is the project name is going to be in URLs. So if you want to share somebody, uh, share the URL with somebody so that they can actually invoke your, your program that you're uh, creating, you want to create a name that you're not embarrassed to share. So we're going to start simple. This first code lab is going to be building the contestant's game player. 
we're going to take the role of a contestant and we're going to write a program that accepts a web request representing, representing the current game state and we're going to respond with a single move. Uh, we're going to deploy that program to the internet, submit the program for judging by providing the URL through a web form, and the judging programs are going to invoke our program over and over again. They're going to invoke our program to make the first move, and then based on the response, they'll maybe make another request for the second move, and so forth. We're going to talk about how all those other parts work later. So recall our high-level system diagram. We're going to do our work on our own laptop, and when our, as a contestant anyway, when we're ready, we're going to deploy our program to a web server. And then we're going to submit the URL to the judging system, which will test our program in the web server and eventually update the standings so we can see where we, where we are relative to everybody else. For this code lab, we're going to work with the player, the program that's deployed to our own web server. The platform we're going to use is Google Cloud Functions. This is a managed serverless program where we just provide a program our source code. And there are a variety of languages supported, including Python, which is what we'll be using today. Python is extremely well supported in cloud functions and, in fact, throughout Google Cloud. We not only have to provide our program, we also have to say what event should trigger our program being run. In this case, case it's going to be when a web request comes in, run our program. And then the platform is responsible for listening for web requests of that URL. When one comes in, it'll trigger our program and send the response from our program back to whoever made the original request. A big benefit of using this the Cloud Function platform is we don't have to do any system administration at all. We just write our program. The program is going to scale as needed. If all of a sudden we have thousands of people wanting to play this game against us, our program will scale up to handle it. Uh, the more likely situation is our program is going to go idle for a long time where nobody's interacting with it. And in that case, the platform is going to be able to scale it down to zero, not incurring costs. The judging system is going to then play a game against our program by first setting the initial game state to the player. And the player is going to look at that and say, OK, I'm going to make my first move and respond with that move. The judging system will update the game state, maybe make a move of its own if it's a two-player uh game, and then it will send the new game state for the next move, and the player is going to respond with that move, one after another. Notice that the player does not have any memory in this case. The only uh, component here that's keeping track of the history of the gameplay is in the judging system, not the player. That means our player doesn't have to keep track of who's making the request, so when it gets one request after another, it, they could be coming from different people or the same person playing a different game. Our player system doesn't need to know that. It's told what the game has been so far and asked for what the next move is. Let's do an example of that with a game everybody knows, Tic-Tac-Toe. The initial game state for Tic-Tac-Toe is an empty board, a three by three grid with a bunch of empty squares. And we're gonna represent that in JSON as a <clears throat> dictionary with a field called marks so far. That's an array of all the marks that have been put on the board and there haven't been any at the beginning. And then what the next mark should be your mark when we're talking to the player. And the first mark should always be an X when you're playing tic-tac-toe. So the player is going to take that game state and respond with its move. And pretty much everybody always makes the first move by putting their X in the middle of the grid. Row 2, column 2. Our game numbers and rows and columns 1, 2, and 3. The judging system is going to process that move and then make a move of its own. So the second request coming from the judging system Maybe something saying, here's an array of the marks so far. There's an X in row two, column two. And there's an O in row one, column one, the upper right-hand corner. It's your turn. Your mark is an X. Where are you going to put the X? And the player is going to respond with a JSON representation of where they want to put that X. In this case, it's going to be the middle of the top row, row one, column two. And this is going to continue until the player can't make a move or until the player wins or until the player completely loses or even crashes. Any of those outcomes are possible. One thing we want to look at when we're dealing with a distributed application like what we're building is how tightly are the different components coupled? How much do we have to know what the opposite part of the system is doing in order to write our part of the system. And in this case, we have very, very little coupling 
between the player and the judging system. The only connection between them is that the judging system makes HTTP requests over the public internet to the player. So there's no issue of sharing resources, dealing with permissions, just a matter of can I send a request and can I respond to that request. That's important because every contestant is building a completely separate player and we don't want them to have to coordinate with one another to avoid stepping on each other's toes with resource sharing. We also don't want them sharing resources with the judging system, which could even be a security problem. In general, not just for a contest like this, but for pretty much any kind of distributed system, minimizing coupling between components makes that system design, deployment, and maintenance a lot more flexible and secure. We're going to keep that in mind throughout, not just this first part. Well, our game is going to be much simpler than tic-tac-toe because we don't want to spend our time talking about how the gameplay should work. We want to talk about how a system gets architected. So we created what we think is pretty much the simplest possible game. Well, we didn't really create it. Everybody's done this before. The guess a number game. We give the contestant a minimum and maximum number and a history of guesses so far, and the contestant comes back and makes a guess, a whole number. We don't worry about the judging system. We just have to write the player. But if you want, after we're done building this, and we'll come back to this at that point, you can actually submit your solution to our example judging system at serverlessworkshopdemo.appspot.com. Well, the game's going to be played by the judging system sending a web request to our player, and the web request is going to be a JSON representation of the state of the game so far. Well, at the beginning, we may say, guess a number from 1 to 10. And that would be represented by the JSON object with a minimum of 1, a maximum of 10, and an empty history. No guesses so far. The playing system is going to respond with its guess, also in JSON. For example, it may just return 6. And yes, 6 is the JSON representation of a whole number. We don't need any quotation marks or curly braces or anything like that. Just 6 for our guess. The second time around, the judging system is going to say, make another guess of a number between 1 and 10, you previously guessed six, but the real answer is higher than that. And the game is going to come back and make its next guess. Uh, ideally, it will be seven, eight, nine, or ten, uh, but we don't know how smart our player is. Maybe it'll guess 8,000. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's going to continue until the judging system gets tired of letting the player make guesses or until the player guesses the correct number. So let's go ahead and build and deploy this solution. There's a hands-on code lab available. Again, the link is available from serverlessworkshop.dev, and the particular link for this is serverlessworkshop.dev slash player. So, here is the code lab. It's a step-by-step -step, uh, move through how to build the game. It explains the background that we've already been covering. Uh, you've got to create a solution called a player as a web service to make one move at a time. We explain what the game is. The, the game, we give examples of the JSON input and the JSON output and describe what we're going to build. We're going to build a game, a cloud function that looks at the request to see what the state of the game so far is and makes a guess and return that single integer. We're going to write this using Python 3.7. Although if you're watching this workshop fairly far in the future, we may instead be supporting Python 3.8. Nothing about what we're going to do will really change much at that point. And we're going to see how to test that cloud function. In order to do this, you're going to need a modern web browser such as Chrome or Firefox or Safari or Microsoft Edge. Any modern web browser can do this work. And you're going to have to have some basic understanding of the Python programming language. So in order to get set up, we need to build a GCP project. This is the first part of the game playing system you've ever worked on, so we're going to create a project for it, and we're going to use that project for all the other parts later on. You go to console.cloud.google.com. Let's take a look at that console. Here I've already created a project called Serverless Workshop Engle Key, or I could have called it Engle Key Serverless Workshop. You can see the project name, and in this case, the project ID are the same. There's also a system uh, generated project number. We're going to work using the Cloud Shell, which is a command line available through the web browser that runs on a virtual machine uniquely created for you in Cloud Shell. We just click this Activate Cloud Shell button, 
It takes a minute to start the uh, Cloud Shell virtual machine. There's no charge for this virtual machine. It's very nice. It's a Linux command line. You could do all this on your local machine in Mac, Windows, or Linux, but you'd have to install some software, all of which is already installed in Cloud Shell. All right, now that we're in Cloud Shell, what are we going to do? Well, the first thing we're going to do is get the source code. That's on GitHub, and so we need to issue a git clone command. And again, all the software we need, in this case, the git clone command, is already, is already built in to our Cloud Shell environment. So let's paste this with Control V. And it does the clone. And if we do an LS, we see that it has downloaded all the stuff from that GitHub repository. We're going to want to take a look at this. So let's go ahead and open the Cloud Shell editor. The look and feel of this has changed over time, and it may change again if you're dealing with this a few months down the road. But basically, you're going to have the same thing where you've got a command line, Cloud Shell, and the ability from there to click to open an uh, interactive, easy to use web editor. Uh, the first time you open it can take a minute. And here we are. We see our editor. We can go and look at the player. And we've got um, a variety of different Python programs that can play the game. It's a very, very simple program to play a very, very simple game. Okay, let's go take a look at the code lab and see what we should be doing next. We're going to create, test, and invoke a cloud function to play the game. So again, we need to go back to the console, and we can open another instance so we can not have to go back and forth between different parts of it all the time. That's something I really prefer to do rather than keep navigating forward and back. Just open another tab. So we're going to have the console at console.cloud.google.com. We need to collect, select our project and create a new function by going to the cloud function section of the compute component. So when we look at the console, over here we have a menu icon. We click on it and we have all the different things we can do in the console broken down into general categories. In this case we're looking at the compute category and we want to look at cloud functions. The first time we ever go to this we may have to wait a minute for it to initialize the environment but fairly soon we're going to have the ability to create a new function. Okay, we got a form to create the function. Let's step back to the code lab to see how we should fill this form out. We need to name the function player. We need to decide what kind of trigger we are, and we're going to need to put in our source code. So let's take a look at that again. Let's call this function player. We can call it anything. Uh, I always leave the amount of memory at the default unless I know I need more or less. What you pay depends on how long your functions are running times the amount of memory you're using. Uh, how we're going to trigger this function, what kind of events can cause this function to run? And you can see there's quite a variety of different kinds of events that can be handled by functions. We're going to do the simplest one, handle an incoming web request. It shows us the URL that our function is going to be advertised at. We do want to allow unauthenticated invocations. That's because we want the judging system to be able to ask our function to play a game without having to have an account we've already authorized. We're going to do our work with the inline editor, and we're going to do Python 3.7. And you'll notice it already fills in a sample Python program. I'm going to expand this editor window so we can see it more completely. The sample program has a single function in it called Hello World. It's invoked with a, flat, a request object, and that is uh, a Flask framework request object, if you're familiar with the Python Flask framework. Uh, that request object has a variety of methods on it, one of which is get JSON. So if the request comes in with a body that is JSON, this will let us get a dictionary that is loaded from the JSON object. Um, if it's got a message in it, we go ahead and just return the message. So this is kind of... Uh, 
weird sample program, but it is a decent sample program. We're going to completely replace this program with our own. Let's go back to the tab that has the editor open. Here is the program, skipping all of the comments. Let's select it all. Copy it. And replace everything in here. Well, I guess I got to do control V. And that's our function. We need to import the JSON module because we're actually going to be just working with JSON, uh, namely for our response. So our function is called make guess. It's center request object. We get the JSON out of it. And we look at the field called minimum, and that's what we guess. We're not a very smart playing function. If you ask me if it's a, for, to guess a number between 1 and 10, I'm going to say 1. If you tell me you previously guessed 5 and it really should be higher than that, I'm still going to say 1. Nothing ever said we had to be smart, just that we have to follow the rules. We also need to fill in the requirements.txt, which is a list of any libraries that are not standard on this platform. JSON is built in standard, so we don't have to put anything in the requirements.txt file. Say OK. We then need to tell it that the function it should invoke, because there might be a lot of different functions in here. The function invoked by the platform may call others. We need to say which one the platform should invoke, and it's going to be make guess. We can also fill in environment variables, a lot of other stuff, none of which we particularly need right now. Um, we can set up firewalling, all sorts of interesting things. However, we're just going to go ahead and create, click create to create our function. And it comes up. We have a little spinner showing that the work's happening. That spinner should eventually turn into a green check mark. If instead it turns into a red X, you'd be able to look at the log for messages for what went wrong. For example, one thing that happens to me a lot is I use a non-standard uh, Python library and forget to include it in the requirements.txt. And it's pretty clear from the error message that that's what I've done. So while we're waiting for that to finish initializing, let's go back and look at our code lab to see what we're going to do next. The next thing we're going to want to do is test the function. So we're going to test it with an event that asks us to guess a number between 1 and 10 with no history. So let's go ahead and select that JSON body that should be sent to it to test. Let's see if our console is ready yet. Whoops. It is. It's gone green. So let's go ahead and click on the name of it. And we see that there are four different, pardon me, five different tabs here. Something in general telling us about how many invocations it's had. None yet. Uh, a page telling us how we trigger it, the URL for it. If we open that right now with a web browser, we'd get an error message. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. And the reason we got an error message is we did not write our function to handle a regular get with no body. We wrote our function to deal with a request that includes a JSON body. And the web browser can't send a JSON body. We're going to have to test it another way. We can look at the source code. And if we want to change the source code, we're going to have to click the Edit button which I generally take about five minutes trying to type in here before I realize I've got to click the edit button first. We can set the permissions. Uh, generally, this is only useful if we say require authenticated requests only. In this case, we're not going to do that. We're going to let anybody make a request. And finally, testing. We can fill in the JSON object that should be sent as part of that event. So we're going to paste what we copied, uh, guess a number from 1 to 10 with no history, and click test the function. And the function needs to be initialized since it's never been running, presumably. And it comes back and makes a guess of 1. And it takes a few minutes. The logs always lag a little bit. But eventually, log entries of that invocation will show up. So we've tested it. Seems to work. Let's test it with a more complicated environment where we actually send it a history. So we go back in here paste the more complicated JSON, and say test the function, and it gives us one again. The reason the source code is called badplayer.py is it's a very bad player. OK, now we've tested the function. It seems to be working, but we don't really know if it's working when called over the internet. Uh, we know when it's working when handled in the testing environment provided by the cloud platform. So let's go ahead and test it over the internet. 
So we're going to use the code editor to create a file called game.json with either of these JSON objects in it. So let's go back and look at this editor. Um, let's create that game.json and say new file under player. and paste in the test environment. And it will save automatically, although you can do control S to force it to, if you're like me and wondering, is it really saving fast? And then let's go back to the command line to run our test. We see, let's see, we've got to go into the player subdirectory and we see the game.json that we just created. We're going to use a curl command to make a request over the internet to our cloud function. Curl is a general purpose command line tool that can make pretty much any kind of web request. In this case, we're going to make a post request. We're going to send a header that says our post request should have a header saying the content type is application slash JSON because the data we're sending from the file game.json is in the JSON format. We then have got to put the URL of our function in there. So let's go take a look right now at the command line paste that, whoops, I didn't copy the command first, let's copy that curl command, not including the whole placeholder for the URL, we'll get the real URL in a second, and the real URL is available from our function console under trigger, so let's copy that link address, go back to our cloud shell, paste it, and now we're going to make an actual request over the internet to our cloud function. And it didn't take very long to come back. You might not be obvious that it did come back, but there is the one. We sent the JSON representation of the integer one, which is just the integer one. No new lines, no carriage returns, nothing like that. So curl printed it, and then we immediately see the prompt for the second request. Well, it's working over the internet the way we want it to. Okay, let's take a minute to go and look at another way to create a cloud function. Instead of creating it through the uh, cloud console GUI, we could create it from the command line. And again, that command line could be on our own machine if we had installed the necessary software, but we're gonna do it from the command line in the cloud shell. So we're gonna go to the player directory, and in order to do the deploy using the, deploy using the G Cloud command line interface, we're going to have to have the function we're deploying called main.py. Right now, that's just the way the gcloud function works. It looks for a function called main.py. So we're going to take our OK player and copy it to main.py, and then we're going to deploy the function with this command. So let's copy the command for right now. Let's go back to our cloud shell, and let's copy the OK player to main.py. And we see there are lots of other programs, but the only programs that are actually being used by the cloud deploy function are main.py and requirements.txt. By the way, let's take a look at what we're sending for requirements.txt. Nothing at all. And let's write our gcloud command. Before we invoke it, take a look at the pieces of it. gcloud is the name of the tool that's used for interacting with cloud platform pretty much overall. Functions is the subcommand saying we're going to work with functions as opposed to all the other kinds of resources available in Google Cloud. Uh, what we're going to deploy, we're going to, we're going to deploy this to a new function called, or an existing function, that we're going to call OK Player. Remember, through the UI, we created something called just plain player. This is going to be called OK Player. We specify what runtime we want, namely Python 3.7, how we want it to be triggered with a web request, where the source code is, in this case, it's going to be in the current directory where we're running this command. What the entry point is, that is, when a request comes in, what function in this program should be invoked. We only wrote one function, but still we have to tell it that the function is called make guess, and we want to allow unauthenticated requests so anybody can play the game against this function. And it can take a little while to deploy the function. Once it finishes, we can see it in the console. Let's go look at the function list. And we can see it's being deployed right now. 
After it's deployed, we can test it through the console the way we did before, but we'll go back to the command line and we're going to test it with the curl command again. So while we're waiting, let's recap what we've done. We've created a cloud function, which was pretty simple to use. We just wrote Python source code in the console. We pasted that into a form and we said, Run, deploy this function. It tells us the URL it's going to be at, and we can then invoke it over the web. We've just done it with the command line instead of the interactive editor. And we want to invoke it. We're going to use the same curl command we used before with one change. Uh, the URL, if we go look at our functions console for OK player, the trigger is almost exactly the same, but the tail part of it is called OK player instead of just player. So let's go back and recall that previous command to just change it to OK player and see what it says. Now this player is a little bit smarter. So we gave it a history. We told it guess a number between 1 and 10, but we told it it was higher than 5 and lower than 8. So let's see what OK player actually comes back and guesses. Uh, let me scroll up a little so it's a little easier to see. It came back with a 6, which is a legal, possibly correct guess. And we could go ahead and make more and more guesses, and eventually OK player would win. If we want to look at the source code of that, we can go back to the editor. And that was main.py we deployed. You can see it's much longer source code. It gets the minimum value, and it goes through the history, and it guesses the minimum value. And every time the history says, hey, it's higher or lower than a number, it either raises or lowers the guess so that it's just barely legal, just inside the range. So if we wanted to make a guess from 1 to 10, it might take up to 10 moves. If we wanted to make a guess between 1 and a trillion, it might take up to a trillion moves. It's not a real smart player. It's just an OK player. OK, we're done with that cloud function. Uh, again, serverlessworkshop.dev has links to all of these other code labs as well as the slides. Let me bring up the slides again. If after you build your function, you want to try them out, go ahead and point your web browser at serverlessworkshopdemo.appspot.com. There'll be a form there for you to paste your URL in and a name so it'll stand out in the standings as to what name is actually running this. And you can submit the player and look at the responses. So again, we have a game where the player does one simple thing, make one move given the existing game state. The player doesn't keep track of any of that state, which means a lot of different uh, systems can be playing this game against it at one time without interfering with one another because the uh, judging systems are actually keeping the state. Moves are made in response to a web request and the cloud function platform invokes the code whenever a request arrives. We don't have to manage a web server or anything like that. Before we go on to the next part, just want to make you aware of a possible gotcha that once in a while gets people. Even though we wrote an entire program, I mentioned several times that we need to tell the cloud platform which method in our program to run. Well, one mental model that you could develop, and at one point I had, is that every time a function comes in, I mean a request comes in, the platform runs our program and invokes that function. But that's not true. If the program's already been run and is already loaded in a live instance, the cloud platform doesn't start it up again. It just invokes our function which means if we've got global initialization code or global variables, from one run to a next, they can interfere with one another. So be careful of that. Uh, I know somebody who actually created, tried to create a complicated gaming system that used a binary Python library that had an awful lot of global state in it and was never able to make it work as a cloud function because each request interfered with what happened in that global state for other requests. So again, remember that your code needs to be stateless. That completes the player. We're now going to move on to the more complicated environment, the judging system, after a break. 
Now that we've built the sample game playing submission, the player, it's time to look at the larger, more complex, and frankly more interesting aspect of the game playing system. Remember, as we go through building the judging system, that all the slides and exercises we're going to be dealing with are online at serverlessworkshop.dev. Recall the high-level system diagram of what we're trying to build. The contestant does the work on their own laptop, and when their solution is ready, they deploy it to a web server, a Google Cloud Function web server, that's under their control. Once they do that, they have a URL that they submit via a web form to the judging system. The judging system is responsible for testing that game playing program in a variety of scenarios, and eventually keeping track of the scores, updating the overall standings, and making that available for anybody to look at on a web page. This looks like a monolith. It's in there just as a box. Judging system does everything. And the traditional approach might be to implement this as a single web server application. Um, what does it do? Well, it interacts with contestants through web pages. It plays games against submitted solutions by making web requests, and it tracks scores in persistent data somehow. But if we built this as a single monolith, we'd be ignoring the fact that there are different communities building different pieces of this, and that we can make these pieces more loosely coupled and farm out the work more simply. Uh, we don't want to restrict the flexibility in the design and future expansion by making this one thing, where if we change anything about the contest, we've got to change the core system. Instead, we're going to recognize that the judging components, the things that exercise the submissions, are often written by the judges who've written the problem statements, not by the people who run the overall contest. Um, that way, if we want to judge a different game, we don't have to rebuild the whole system, we just have to build the single rebuild the single judging component. The other problem here is that if we made this a single web system, when somebody made a submission, they'd have to wait for a response to come back until the submission was processed, meaning all of the sample games were played, which would be a delay unless we write a more complicated system that handles background processing or concurrency. All that could be done, but it's a lot easier to do this in a distributed serverless environment. So let's look at what we need to build one thing at a time. And let's pull out the first piece, which is something needs to play this game against the submitted solutions. We're going to call this something the questioner. The questioner is going to go ahead and ask the player, in this case, guess a number. And it's going to keep a track of what the guesses were, and it's going to then ask again with the updated history over and over again. And in fact, there might be a lot of questioners that are simultaneously hitting this game for different situations, different scenarios. Um, in order to do that, the questioner needs to know how to talk to the game player. It needs to know the URL. Uh, it'll then play the game against the player, and when it's all done, it's going to have a result. It needs to know what to do with the result. So we're going to build this questionnaire as an independent component. We're going to give it the URL for the player. And in terms of what to do with the result, we're going to say, hey, when you got the result, put it in a JSON object and post it to a particular address. Somebody else will handle keeping track of it. Again, we're going to punt this problem, kick it down the road, let it be somebody else's issue on how to keep track of the results. The questioner is going to just deal with playing the game. It's going to be easy to run multiple questioners against each submission that way, and we're going to use an asynchronous request to trigger the start of play, so that when it comes time to ask the questioner to play the game, we just send that off and say, please play the game. When you're all done, here's where to send the result. We aren't going to wait for you to finish this. We don't care. We just trust that once we ask you, you'll eventually get the job done. Once again, we're going to choose Cloud Functions as our platform. We could use any compute service, probably, but Cloud Functions are a good fit because this is a single, well-defined task that is triggered by an event. The event being the judging system saying, hey, judge this submission. Now, we're going to do that not by the judging system sending a web request, but by the judging system triggering it asynchronously. Cloud functions have a lot of different ways you can trigger them. What we saw with the player was triggering them with a web request. But we want to trigger this one on an asynchronous message being sent to it, uh, a message being published to a pub sub topic by the rest of the judging system. Now, what is this pub sub? Google PubSub is a reliable messaging system, and really every cloud platform has these kinds of messaging systems. They're core to distributed computing, where when one component 
have, need something else to be done, they don't make a request and wait for it to come back. They just send a message saying, do this job. We trust you'll get it done. The messages that are being sent in Google PubSub belong to topics. And when somebody wants to send a message, we say they publish that message to the topic. So there might be a topic saying, play games, and you'd send a message saying, play a game against this URL, sending the results to this other URL. Programs subscribe to a topic to get all the messages. So every one of these questioners would subscribe to that play game um, topic, and they get triggered every time anybody publishes a message to it. This can be one-to-one, one-to-many, or many-to-many. PubSub is asynchronous, reliable delivery. Messages are guaranteed to be delivered to every subscriber, but they're only guaranteed to be delivered at least once. They could be delivered more than once. In this case, that's not a big problem because it just means we waste the, our time judging the same problem more than once, but in the exact same conditions and presumably get the exact same result. Also, the delivery order is not guaranteed, which for our purposes doesn't particularly matter. If people submit three problems and we judge them in a different order from what they're submitted, eventually it all comes out in the wash. It doesn't really make a difference. So if we want to trigger this via PubSub, the way it works is there's a topic called Play Game. The judging system, when a new submission comes in, just publishes a message to that topic. And in this case, we might have three different questioners that judge the problem under three sets of scenarios, all subscribing to that topic. They're all triggered when the message comes in at basically the same time. They all talk to the same player, but they're independent web requests with independent histories that each questioner is tracking. So it doesn't, they don't interfere with one another. And eventually when they're all done, we've told them, hey, post a JSON object with your results to this URL. Somebody else will handle it from there on. Which leads to the question of why don't we just send HTTP requests? The reason is basically that they're synchronous. When you send a request, you wait for a response and we don't wanna to have to wait. Now you could say, hey, we'll send a request, we'll have the thing immediately respond, but then keep working. But in fact, if you're gonna use Google Cloud Platform, that isn't gonna work. Because Cloud Platform is intended to, write, to run the code to respond to a request. If you've got a function that is triggered by a web request, once it sends the response, the platform decides that function's done and it stops giving it any CPU cycles, so it can't keep running. PubSub is asynchronous. Uh, when an invoker wants to send a message, they send it, to, they give it to PubSub and get a PubSub saying, okay, I've got it. They don't then wait around for PubSub to actually deliver it and for the people that it's delivered to to actually execute what you're asking. So, we're going to start by factoring out the questioners from this system. And when we look at the overall picture, what had been that one monolithic block for a judging system is now several pieces. We still have some unknown set of components that interact with the contestant, that the contestant can use a web form to submit a URL and can go look at a web page to see the results and standings. But what the judging system does with that URL is it says, hey, I need somebody to judge this, this uh, problem submission. So all it does is publish the message to a topic and one or more questionnaires subscribe to that topic and play the game. When they're all done, they post the response somewhere. Presumably that's another part of the judging system. We're gonna to have to get to how that works sooner or later. The message body that we're gonna post needs to include the URL of the player. In other words, play a game against the player at this URL. It needs to include a URL for where to send the result to. So when you're all done, send the result here. Also, we're gonna to need to keep track of which uh, submission that questioner was, was testing. If you've got five people submitting solutions, we don't wanna get five results and not know which result went with which solution. So we're gonna have a random ID that we create called a contest round every time somebody submits a solution. And that needs to go in the message as well. And finally, because they're going to send that result back in a URL, we want to know that when somebody gives something to us, it's somebody we asked to give that to us. In other words, we don't want somebody else able to just spam the result URL with fake results. So when we send the message to somebody, to a questioner, telling that questioner to play a game, we're going to include a secret just for that one message that we keep track of so when the results come back, our system can somehow make sure it's from the person we asked to have run it or actually the function we asked to have run it. 
We always want to look at the coupling that we're invoking when we add these more these greater components because every piece of coupling means that a change in one has to be reflected in what's on the other side of that. There's coupling between the questioner and the player. That is the coupling we already talked about when we were looking at the player side. It's web requests and responses. Very loose coupling. For the bigger part of the judging system and the questioner components, there's a little bit tighter coupling in that they're, they're coupled by sharing a pub sub topic. The judging system has to be able to publish messages to that topic and the questioners need to be able to subscribe to that topic to receive the messages. Fairly loose, not quite as loose as just sending web requests. And finally, results have to be sent somewhere. That coupling is again going to be a web request. The questioner is going to send the result by making a web request, a post object with a JSON object in its payload to the provided URL. So it's time to build and deploy the solution. We have a hand-on code lab at serverlessworkshop.dev slash questioner. So let's go over to that code lab and take a look at it. We begin with an introduction. You can see there's a lot more steps than there were for just the player. Uh, we describe the game that's going to be played. We've already gone over that. The input and the output, the example of uh, how the questioner interacts with the player. We talked about that in depth when we were building the player. And how the questioner is going to be told what to do. It's going to receive a message with this JSON information. The URL of the player function, some URL to send the result to, a uh, unique ID for the contest round, and a random unguessable secret for sending that re result back. When it plays the game, it'll see the result, and when it's all done, it's going to have to send the result back to the URL it was asked for, for the result URL. That, when it sends it back, it's going to have to identify which questionnaire it is, because we may have asked three different questioners to play the game against a submission. Those questioners all have different scenarios. When the results come back, we want to know which scenario we're getting the result for. So each questioner is going to pick a name for itself so that we can identify which is which. The questioner's also got to tell us what contest round they're reporting a result for. They're going to have to include that secret so we know that somebody isn't just spamming us, that it's somebody that received our original message and hence knows what the secret is. And then they're going to have to tell us the result. In this case, one, loss, tied, hung, crashed, whatever it happens to be. And we're interested in how many moves it took, or in this case, how many guesses it took to get there. So in this tutorial, you're going to build a computer program that will act as a questioner. And it's going to set up the game state, ask the player to make a move, update the game state, ask the player to make another move, and so forth until there's a result. Either the players finally guessed the correct answer, or the player just stopped responding, or we just get tired of asking the player. Maybe we gave it a thousand guesses and it still hasn't guessed. We're just not going to keep asking it, whatever that, diff whatever that limit is. And that's up to the questioner how patient it's willing to be. We're going to invoke this questioner by sending a message to a pub subtopic, uh, and it's going to report the result via URL in that message. So we need a web browser that we've been using up till now and basic knowledge of the Python programming language. To get set up, we need to go to the project we've already created in Google Cloud Console at console.cloud.google.com. And we're going to need to select the project. And we're going to have to open the Cloud Shell and fetch our code. We did all that when we were do dealing with the player. We don't have to repeat those steps if we've already done the player steps. Now, we're going to trigger this by a message sent to the pub subtopic. So before we can write a questioner, we have to create the topic that's going to trigger it. Uh, in the real world, the people managing the contest would probably create these topics and then tell everybody to write the questioners. But the order we're going through, we're ready to create a questioner. We need a topic. Let's go ahead and create one. We need to go to the PubSub section of the Cloud Console, and we're going to select PubSub from the Big Data section. So. Let's go ahead and open a new tab so we don't have to keep going back and forth too much. We already have a tab open uh, for keeping track of the functions and keeping track of the cloud shell. In this tab, we're going to look at the pub subtopics. 
So we pull down the menu once the page finishes loading. And whoops, let me try that again. And we have to scroll down until we get to the pub sub section, which happens to be near the bottom under big data. Pub sub. If it's the first time we've done it, we may have to wait for the pub sub system to initialize, but eventually we'll be able to go ahead and create the topic we're going to need by clicking create topic. Let's look again at the code lab to see how we should fill this in. We basically just need to give this topic a name. We're going to call it play a game and tell it whether we're going to manage the keys or Google will manage it. The main reason you'd create your own key and, man and provide it, which is more work, is if you want to keep control of that completely in your own company, perhaps for security or compliance reasons. We don't have either of those here. It's very secure to let Google contain the keys. So we're going to say play a game. Notice it creates a complete name that's un globally unique for that topic that includes the project it's in as well as the name of the topic and say create topic. All right, it says an out, a new topic has been created. We can publish messages to that topic. We can trigger cloud functions from that topic, etc. All those things we need to do. Let's take a look at the code lab to see what we're going to do next. We're going to create the first questioner. So it's going to be creating a cloud function similar to what we did before, but we're going to see there's going to be an important difference in what triggers it. So let's go back to our cloud functions section, go to the list of all cloud functions, and create a new function. We need to give it a name. It doesn't matter other than for us keeping track of stuff. We'll call it easy questioner. Um, this is one that's going to ask it, in our case, guess a number from 1 to 10. Nothing terribly hard. But we're not going to trigger it by a web request. We're going to trigger it by a message from Cloud PubSub. If we do that, we need to say which topic is going to trigger it. And we've only created the one topic. So it's pretty easy to pick the one we want. We're going to use the inline editor, and we're going to write this in Python. And here, let's expand this. Here's an example. We're going to have a function that is triggered by the platform that's going to send it the published event and the context for the event. Uh, in our case, we're really only going to care about the event, which is a payload, the body of the message. Uh, the context is metadata about the event, which we do sometimes care about, such as when it was sent, how long it's been waiting, and so forth. Let's replace this code with the code we have in our editor under questioners, easy questioner, main.py. So here we see the code we want. Let's go select all the code. There's a lot more to it. And copy it. and go paste it here. Replace what's there. Whoops, the paste didn't seem to include everything. Let me try this again. It chopped off the bottom part. Whoop. Or did it? Nope, it just was part of my scrolling. Nothing I like better than having two scroll bars at once to keep track of where I happen to be. Now the other thing we need to include is the requirements.txt. And here we see we're using three modules, base64, JSON, and the request module. Request is not typically standard in Python, but it is standard in the functions framework, so we're not going to have to include it. Let's make sure of that by taking a look at the requirements.txt that was Put here. And we see again we don't have any special modules. We can leave requirements.txt blank. Okay. 
Now we have to say which function to execute, which one is going to be triggered with the bot with the message. And uh, one we're going to trigger is question player. You can look here and see how that works. It takes it ha the events are generally passed in base 64 encoding in case they, they're binary or have other data. So we generally are going to have to base 64 decode it and then we can load that into a dictionary because our message is JSON. Then we look at get the fields we want out of it, the player and result URL, the contest round and the secret. And then we call a function that'll play the game and tell us the outcome of the moves. And then we call a function to report the score. Those are pretty straightforward. Let's create that function. With luck, we put everything in right, and that's going to change to a green check mark. While we're waiting for that, let's go look at how it works. So again, when a message comes in, the cloud function framework will invoke the question player uh, procedure with the event and the context. The event has data that is our JSON object. It's encoded in base64 by convention, so what we do is we take the data of the event, decode it, that gives us a byte string. If we're going to do load it into JSON, we've got to convert it into uh, UTF-8 and load that into our message, pull out the fields we need, play the game and report the score. Okay, let's take a look and see if it looks like everything's okay. That the function is going to be sitting there ready to run. And again, the trigger is via a topic, not via a URL. We want to test it. So to test it, instead of sending it a web request, we're going to just go ahead and use the testing function right now. Or in fact, we're going to go ahead and publish a message to the topic. So we're going to publish a JSON object that tells the URL to play the game against, where to put the results to, the contest round, and the secret. So let's go ahead and put that stuff in properly under PubSub. Publish a message. Now before we go ahead and say publish it, It says there's no subscriptions, but there, there is one. I guess it just hasn't been updated. We do have to put the URL of the actual function to invoke. So let's go back to our functions. Let's look at the list of functions, and we're going to go ahead and play it against the OK player. So let's get its URL. Copy that address. The result URL has not been written yet. We haven't built the judging system to send the results to. So we've set up a simple little website that tracks everything that's posted to it, and it displays the last 10 or 20 things that have been posted. So we're going to just have this JSON object posted there, and we're going to go then be able to look at that website and see what it looked like. For the contest round, I'm going to call this uh, angle key, PyCon, just something that will help me recognize uh, that the result is my result, and then some secret. Since this isn't going to the real judging system, we don't have to include a secret. It's not going to actually be saved anywhere. Let's publish it and see what happened. Well, if we go back to the player function, we can look at its logs. Was it just triggered? Again, these logs made lag by a minute or two. Right now it's 351, and sure enough, it was triggered several times, which makes sense because it's going to say, make a guess, and then based on that, it's going to say, okay, here are your previous guesses, make another guess, repeated over and over again, and it's been triggered many times. Let's go take a look at that Echoer website that we posted our results to. And we see here that at 2251 UTC, which is the time I, that we use for this, it, we it received an application JSON object that consists of something saying it's the easy questioner, 
that the contest round is for Engelke PyCon, a contest round identifier, the secret, and at one in seven moves. So we're able to test things in fairly good isolation that way. Now let's create another questioner. It's going to be pretty much the exact same questioner, but with three different values. Instead of guessing from 1 to 10, it's going to guess from 1 to, it looks like a billion, and the target is going to be a million, and you're going to have to guess it within 100 guesses. Uh, let's go to our functions. We need to create a new one. Uh, Let's go back to the functions list. Create a new function called hard questioner. Triggered again by a pub subtopic. The same topic in Python. And let's look at our source code. And let's scroll down and grab the source code for the hard questioner instead of the easy questioner. Go back to our function. Replace the sample source code with this code. And again, let's scroll down to make sure we got everything. The only difference here is the range of guesses. Other than that, it's the same. Uh, OK. The function to invoke is going to be question player. Create it. And once that's ready, we can go ahead and test both of them at once by sending one message to the topic. It should trigger both of these functions. Let's give it a minute. Again, it's basically the same topic as we had before. Has our function finished deploying? Not quite yet. Let's start setting up the, oh, there it is. Let's set up the topic and message. Publish a new message. And again, we need to replace the player URL with the correct URL. I'm jumping around quite a bit here. Uh, let's use the OK player. Let's see, is there a shortcut to get that trigger? No. So I'm going to drill into it and click the Trigger tab. Put that in my topic. Um, give it another name so I can keep track of it. And publish it. Let's go take a look at the echoer, see if anything new has appeared there. Yes, the easy questioner has reported uh, the result. The hard questioner hasn't yet. And the reason for that is that the hard questioner will let them do 100 steps. And until the 100 step is up, it won't give up. So it'll take a little bit longer. And there it is. The hard questioner came out, and it was failed. After 100 moves, it did not guess because it was always guessing the lowest possible number, and it was going to take a million guesses to get there. OK, we have now deployed two questioners triggered by the same thing. We now can go take a look again at what we've completed. So we're going to build. We built and deployed the solution. Now let's take a recap. We built another event-driven cloud function. It was triggered asynchronously. PubSub let us send one message that hit many questioners. The questioners create the result that need to be saved, but they're not responsible for saving it. They just send it somewhere. 
somebody else's problem, again, reducing system coupling. Now, dealing with all of that is the remaining part of the judging system. And we're going to deal with that in the next step, the judging system part two after a break. Welcome back to the workshop for building a distributed serverless application using Google Cloud Platform. The first part talked about the background for the application. The second part of the workshop showed how to build the contestants portion of the application. That is a program that played a game that would be judged by the system as a whole. The third part, the previous part to this one, actually built the part that judged the, the submissions. Now we're going to do the final part, which is the administrative center of the overall system. The thing that manages uh, contestants being able to submit their solutions, showing standings, asking the judging systems to actually do the judging and so forth. Remember, you can do all of this on your own later if you want. The slides and exercises are all online at the serverlessworkshop.dev website. That site also includes my email address and an email address for sending in requests in general about this workshop. Well, the system so far that we've looked at consists of the contestants part of the system, a laptop where they do their work, and a web server where they deploy their solution, and then the judging system, the part where the contestant submits the URL of the website, the judging system uses the questioner that was developed in the last part, one or more questioners, to actually play the game. They report their results back to the judging system, which is still kind of a black box. And uh, contestants can at any time go to that website and view the results and standings. We're focusing on the remaining unknown part of the system, that question mark box. This is something we're going to call the manager going forward because it's the administrative center of the whole thing. The manager is responsible for a few things. First of all, anybody in the contest, or probably anybody anywhere, can go to that website and they'll look at all the current standings of all the submissions and how people are doing relative to one another. It's also where the consultants will go and get a web form that they use to submit the URL of their solutions so that they can then be judged and put into the standings. The manager is responsible for asking the questioners to judge the submissions. They do that just by publishing a message to a particular pub subtopic and all the different questioners that do the judging themselves uh, subscribe to that topic. So they're all triggered by that submission. And finally, when those questioners have finished judging a submission, they've got a result, they've got to do something with it. They're told, here's a URL, please send the results there and somebody will be responsible for it. Well the manager is the thing that's going to be responsible for it. So we have to handle receiving those results. Let's see, can we partition this further? So far, we've really focused heavily on doing divide and conquer. So each component we built has been pretty small. Can we make this smaller by breaking it into different pieces that do different things? Well, if we look at it, we see that two of these four responsibilities of the manager are building a website that interacts with people either showing a person the standings or giving the person a form to submit a request to have a problem judged. One of the parts accepts the results from questioners. That is, it needs to interact with software, not with people, because it's the questioners, the software programs, that are sending these results in. So we're going to break it down into those parts. We're going to have a web application, a standard website, that people interact with. And we're going to have a web service, something intended as an API that programs interact with, that will accept the results from the questioner software. These two parts are only going to be connected by one shared piece of infrastructure, and that's going to be a database, the database that keeps track of all the submissions and all the results. Because the web application needs to show the stuff from that database, and it also needs to say there's a new submission in that database, and the web service needs to tell the result of every judging run. So when we look at the system as a whole and see how the different parts or component are, are uh, connected, we see that we have a manager app, that's the website, that uses a database in order to keep track of all the scores and what's been submitted. 
We also see that there's a manager service that's responsible for updating that database with the reported scores from the questioners. Uh, the questioners themselves are invoked by subscribing to a pub sub topic. The manager app is responsible for publishing those requests as messages to that topic. The questioners interact with the manager service simply by sending a web request over the internet. And the questioners interact with the players simply by sending um, a web request over the internet as well. The manager service and the players themselves don't directly interact. So these are the different components. There are four parts. They're connected by either the internet or sharing a database or getting messages through a pub subtopic. We're going to add one more piece to this that is optional. We're going to cover this at the very end, but that is user authentication because our manager app can simply let anybody say, please run my submission. By the way, my name is Jay. And then that person come back and say, well, please submit, run my new submission, but my name now is Mark. And somebody else can come along and say, run my submission, but my name is Jay and overwrite the other Jay's submissions. By having front end user authentication, we can make sure that although somebody can come in and say whatever nickname they want, they can't change it and they can't impersonate somebody else. That's a really nice feature called Identity Aware Proxy that we can do with very minimal changes to the rest of our application. So what have we got to deploy? Well, the two new components, the manager application, that is a website, the manager service, which is a web service, then the database that connects those two pieces. We also will, at the very end, put the identity or a proxy in front of the manager app so that requests only reach our website if they've already been authenticated and they're going to have a header added to them telling who the authenticated user is. So let's go ahead and build and deploy the solution. We have a hands-on code lab that we're going to go through this and it's available at serverlessworkshop.dev slash manager. So let's take a look at that. Uh, we go, we've got some background, which we've now seen in two other code labs, explaining the overall problem and describing what the manager is responsible for doing. It records the fact that somebody's made a submission, sends a message to a pub sub topic so that those questioners all judge the submission and then accept the results back from those questioners so it can update its database. We're going to build the database and we're going to use Firestore, which is a NoSQL database that also scales to zero, just like our various computing solutions do. So if nobody's interacting with the database, you pay for storage, but you don't pay for compute time. Um, a cloud function that's used for the web service, that's going to be triggered by the questioners sending their results into it. And a web application, and we're going to use App Engine for that. App Engine is a serverless platform. It's actually the first serverless platform that Google Cloud provided, and it's optimized for creating interactive websites, which is exactly what we need. And finally, we're going to put the Identity Aware proxy in front of that optionally so that requests only reach that App Engine web app once they've been authenticated and those requests have the authenticated information added as headers to the request. So we're going to see how to do all of those things, create the Firestore database. Uh, once again, we're going to deploy a cloud function, just like we've done in the previous two labs. We're going to deploy an App Engine application, and we're going to see how to restrict access to that application. All you're going to need for this is a modern web browser uh, and basic knowledge of the Python programming language. So to get set up, we're going to need to create a project and open the console to that project. We've already done that as part of our previous two uh, code labs. We're also going to need to get the source code, which we've already also received. So let's go and take a look at our console. We see in our console that we have the source code available here, the questioners, the source code for the manager components and so forth. And if we want, we can go to the terminal and we can run commands there with all of the necessary software already pre-installed. Okay, the first thing we're going to do now is create a database, a Firestore database. Cloud Firestore is a NoSQL database that we're going to use for our shared persistent data. 
remember all of our computing components are stateless. They can't remember any information from one web request or one event to the next. So if they want to remember anything, they've got to store it externally, and this is where they're going to store it. Uh, Firestore works on collections of documents. Now, a document doesn't mean a paper a person reads. A document in this case just means a structured chunk of data, something like a Python dictionary. So we're going to have a collection of documents, one for each submitted contestant's request. We're going to call those submissions rounds, contest rounds. The contestant comes in and says, here's a new submission, please judge it. That will be a round in our collection. The round is going to tell us who submitted it. It's going to create a unique ID for that round. Um, it's going to keep track of the URL that needs to be judged. And then it's going to have a sub-collection of runs. Every questioner that runs a, a judging round, well, actually does a judging run, is going to report back its scores, and those scores are going to be in the runs collection. Each of those is going to say which questioner did this and what the outcome was and how many moves it took. Turns out that these things are very easy to work with in Python. The API is quite simple. We'll take a look at it when we examine the source code we're going to deploy. Now, in order to use Cloud Firestore, it's got to be enabled. You can enable it with the gcloud command line interface, or you can simply go into the Cloud Console. Let's go ahead and do that. Go into the Cloud Console, and we want to go to the Cloud Firestore section, so I'm going to open a new instance of it and a new tab, so I don't have to keep going back and forward. And it's going to take a minute for this instance of the console to open up. And once it does, I'm going to use the menu in this upper corner to go to the Cloud Firestore section. Uh, Cloud Firestore is data. Well, data storage. So we have here Firestore. Notice that there's also File Store, which is totally different. It's got one entire letter difference. Now, one thing about Cloud Firestore is it actually has two modes. And that's because originally there was another NoSQL database on Google Cloud called Data Store. Now, it's still available, but it's provided simply by putting a different interface in front of Firestore. So you have to choose one or the other. We're going to choose Firestore in native mode instead of having it behave like Data Store. So select native mode. This is a choice that we can't go back on. We've got to pick it, and if we wanted to use something different, we'd have to create a new project. We now have to say where our database should be stored. Um, we can either store it in multi-region with five nines SLA or a single region with only four nines SLA. Well, there's a very high free tier available for Firestore. It's unlikely we're going to exceed it anyway. So even though multi-region would cost more, we're probably not going to incur any costs anyway. So we're going to go ahead and choose the United States multi-region and create that database. That's going to take a few minutes to go ahead and build. Nothing will be in it. So let's go on to the next steps. We need to create a cloud function that's going to be our web service that will accept results from the questioners and update the Firestore database in order to include those results. So we're going to go into the cloud section section of the console and create an HTTP triggered uh, web service called Manager. So again, let's go over to our console, open another instance so we don't have to use the back arrow too much. It takes a minute for this to come up, depending on how fast your current internet connection is. Things are busy right now. Once it finishes coming up, we can go where we've been several times before, go into the compute section, and choose Cloud Functions. Which now has some questioners and some players. Let's go ahead and create another function. This one is going to be the manager that receives results.
We're going to trigger it with a web request. We're going to allow unauthenticated invocations because otherwise we would have to provide credentials to every questioner so that they could send us results. That might be nice and more secure, but it also would be harder to, inter to manage and create coupling. We're going to have a different way that we keep unauthenticated users from talking to us. This is going to be Python again. Let's make this bigger. And let's look at the source code for the manager function. And scroll down, select it all. copy it into a buffer, and replace the current function code with that. And again, we have the weird outcome that we have nested scroll bars, so it's a little tricky to make sure everything got copied. If we take a look at this, this is a save result. It sent the web request. It's going to get the JSON information for the result as a, into a dictionary and pull out the five pieces of data that are sent to us as a result. It's then going to look up the contest round that this result is for. And if it doesn't exist, if there is no such round, it'll say a 404, not found. Then if it does exist, it's going to check that the, that the request includes the secret that the manager originally set up for this contest rounds reports. If the secret doesn't match, it's going to return forbidden. So that's how we're going to keep people from sending fake results to our system. When we send the message to the questioner, we include a secret. When the questioner reports results, it's got to give us the same secret. Now notice, in order to actually interact with the database, the Firestore database, it's very, very simple. We create a collection object for rounds that either may already exist or we may have, have had to create a new one. And then we get the document for the current contest round value that was sent to us in the web request. Now, when we get that, it may not exist. There's a method that tells us that. But if it does exist, we can convert that round to a dictionary and get any field out of it. And we want to get the secret field to make sure it matches. If it does match, then we're going to add to the sub collection runs. So this particular document, the contest round, can have one or more collections. Here we have a collection named run. And we're going to add a dictionary with the outcome, the number of moves, and what questioner, and acknowledge that that succeeded. In order to do this, we're not only going to have to use the standard JSON module, we're going to have to use the non-standard Google Cloud Firestore module. So that's going to have to be put in the requirements.txt file. So let's go back to our source code. Take a look at the necessary requirements.txt, and we see we need to use a recent version of the Google Cloud Firestore library. Okay, the function that will actually be executed is save result. And let's go ahead and create that new function. While we wait for that check mark to come in, or come in as a red X if something goes wrong, let's see if our Firestore database is finished uh, being set up. It is. We can create our own collections, but we'll let the software do that. So the function is going to be worked going to be used by sending a post request with a JSON object. We looked at that when we actually built the questioners, how we'd send that request. And then as we showed, it's going to extract the data and update the database. Cloud Firestore is really easy to work with from Python. We now want to test the function. And we're going to test it by filling in a trigger with a JSON object that represents a request to make a move. So let's go ahead and copy that JSON, go back to our cloud function, which still hasn't quite finished uh, initializing. Once it does, we can go into the test tab and test it. 
All right. Click on Manager. Go into the Testing tab. Replace the triggering event with the one from the Code Lab, which says we're reporting results for a contest round called One. Uh, the secret that we were told to use to report it is not very. Uh, the name of the questioner, the program that's actually doing the submission is Easy Questioner. The, uh, when it ran this, uh, this uh, submission, the submission won the game in 10 moves. So let's go ahead and test the function. And we get a 404, not found. Because there is no contest round in our database for contest round one. Nobody asked for that to be judged, so we're not going to store any results for it to come in. So let's fix that problem by actually having a contest round in the database for one. So go to our data Firestore, say we want to start a collection. The collection is going to be called rounds. The first document is going to be called one. And we're going to put fields in it. Right now, let's just put in a field for the secret. Say the secret is shh. Um, I think that is the only field we need. Let's take a look at the code lab. Yep. Save it. And we now have a collection with one document for contest round one. It has one field in it called secret whose value is shh. Let's test our function again. Now we get a 403 forbidden, and that's because the secret we're providing, not very, doesn't match the secret in the database, which is shh, S with three H's and an exclamation point. So let's go ahead and change that secret to match the one that supposedly was would have been given to it, and test the function one more time. And with luck. There, 201 means created. It actually supposedly created something. Let's see if that's telling the truth. Let's look at our one document. Uh, refresh this page. To, because we want to see if there's a sub collection there. It'll often refresh itself, but sometimes there's a lag. So let's force it to refresh. And we see that for rounds, there is one document called one that has a field called secret whose value is shh. And it has a sub collection called runs. Runs has one document in it that was given a random ID by the system since we didn't provide an ID. And that random ID has a document with three values in it, the three values that we sent to it in our JSON file. So the function does seem to be working the way we want it to work. And just to keep things clean, let's go back into the runs collection and delete that one document that we could put in there manually. That's going to also delete all of its child uh, subcollections. OK. Now, let's go ahead and create the web application using App Engine. We're going to go ahead and look into the App Engine section. And let's go ahead and just open a new tab for the console. And we'll go into App Engine. And we're going to see that things are going to be a little bit different for this than everything else we've done with the console. And that's because we cannot create App Engine apps through the console. We have to do that from the command line. There are simply too many pieces to have a good console experience. So let's go in here to App Engine. The first time we do that, it may take a minute to initialize. But it says, OK, welcome to App Engine. There's an empty App Engine app. 
but there's been nothing deployed to it yet. Let's see how to deal with that. We need to go into the serverless game contest set source code, the manager app engine subdirectory, and let's take a look at what's in there. Manager app engine. We have our actual program, main.py, and it is a Flask web app. You can read about Flask elsewhere, but basically what it does is it lets you decorate different functions with the paths that should, that should be given to it to handle. So let me go on up here. I over scrolled past it. Here we see if uh, somebody makes a request to slash request round with a post, it's going to go ahead and pull stuff out of the form and check who submitted it, update the database if there's been a requested round. Let me scroll down. It'll then use PubSub to send the message to all the questioners to actually play the game. Similarly, if we scroll up, we see that if somebody makes a request to that same path, request round, but with a get, it's going to just return the form. And if it makes a request to the root, the slash page, with a get, it will go through the database, build a data structure with all of the results from all the rounds, and then it'll use, it'll render a template filling in the data from those results so that the user will see what, is stand, what the current standings are. And then there are some helper functions for keeping track of the user nicknames. Fairly straightforward. There are several different Python modules that are non-standard that need to be included, so it also has a requirements.txt file. Even if we don't have any non-standard modules, App Engine is going to require we have a requirements.txt file. It can be empty, but it has to exist. And the one big new thing in App Engine is app.yaml, a YAML file that says which of the many App Engine run file times and other environment uh, uh, selections you have to make. In order to do Python 3.7, all we have to have in there is one line. This is the runtime. It's the runtime for Python 3.7. We have a couple of templates that are used to build the web pages. They're simply fill in the blank templates for the home page and the page with the form. And we have some minimal testing, basically something that just checks that when we ask for the home page, we get a home page that has the word standings in it. Probably it'd be nice to be more thorough with this. Okay, that's what the source code looks like. In order to deploy it, we're going to have to go ahead and use a command line uh, G, uh, G Cloud command in, uh, from our sh cloud shell. Before we deploy it, though, there's one line we need to update in our source code, and that is the line saying where the manager function that we just created is. That's because when this function sends a message to all the questioners to do their testing, their, their actual checking submitted runs, it's got to tell them what URL to send the results back to. And that's going to be the URL of the function we just created. So let's go ahead and change that one line in our source code uh, for main.py. Result.url equals, and we need to put in our manager functions URL. Well, that's going to be over here in the functions tab. The trigger is right there. We'll copy its address. And put that in our source code. Again, it'll be saved automatically, but just because of habit, I tend to do control S anyhow. All right, now that it's ready, we can deploy the app, and it's really, really simple to do after all that preparation. Go back to our console, go to the terminal, change the correct directory. and say gcloud app deploy. All of the necessary account credentials and project definition and everything that is needed for this to work are built into the Cloud Shell environment. All right, we're asked, is this what you really want to deploy? 
uh, this YAML and source file to this target project and it tells us the URL that it's going to end up with and yes let's go ahead and do that it uploads our files and then it's going to go ahead and update and cre create the new version and update it that's going to take a few minutes so let's read ahead to what's going to happen next well we've already looked over the code so we have a sense of how it works the one thing that's a little bit tricky is what the nicknames are doing and we're going to talk about that really when we talk about identity aware proxy but there's a little bit of background here if we put identity aware proxy in front of our app engine app then every request that gets sent to the app is going to be first filtered through the identity aware proxy and it's going to only, only going to let requests through if it's already authenticated the person making the request if it has authenticated that person it is going to include a header with information about that person's uh, Google email address and a unique Google ID code um, all that kind of stuff that we're going to use if we need to use it so get nickname is going to look in the form um, if it doesn't have anything that's already been saved in the database for the nickname so get nickname when we see a user we check to see if we know that user if we don't already know that user we'll get the nickname out of the form we'll save it um, otherwise we'll say hey we need to have a nickname again we're going to talk about exactly how that works when we get to identity where proxy we now should be able to go ahead and run this app let's actually take a look have we finished the deployment not quite yet uh, usually by now it would be ready while we're waiting again look ahead all we need to do is say gcloud app browse and it will show us the URL and we can open the page to see the URL go ahead and give it a try let's step ahead while we're waiting for it to deploy and take a look at how it uses identity where a proxy <clears throat> okay in order to use identity where proxy we're going to have to enable it we'll go through those steps when we get finished deploying and testing it but once it's deployed and we've said that we are going to allow anybody to use our app what it will do is when you go to the home page you're going to be forced to log in first that login doesn't go to your app it goes to identity where proxy but from that point on every time you make a request that request is going to include some headers let's scroll down here the headers include the authenticated users email a user ID code that's unique to that user and a digitally signed assertion that has that information as well if you want to make sure that nobody could have somehow slipped you bad headers that's not really possible in the simple architecture we've created where you don't have any other programs that can bypass the uh, identity or proxy once we use those information that information the app is going to remember the nickname the first time it's shown it and it's going to do that by getting the user ID from the header and saving it in a nickname collection that's all so if a person says my name is Mary it's going to save okay user Mary exists for this Google unique user ID that's all it needs to do and then get nickname later when we come along and say hey when we see a new page uh, do we know who this user is already it's going to look up that authenticated user ID header and if it's there it's going to look up the nickname in the database and it's going to ignore whatever nickname the user submits again so the user is not going to be able to say hey I'm Mary in one submission and then say I'm Susan in the next we're going to know that that's not going to work so have we finished the deployment yes we have so gcloud app browse uh, it comes it says go to this url so click it and our application is run and we don't have any contest standings yet we can request a new contest round so I can say hey I'm John Doe 
And for the URL, let me go to my functions tab and pick one of my uh, players and give it that URL. Um, let's give it the OK player and see what its URL is, its trigger. So let's go back to our request a contest round. Requests a round and it's going to return us, it's already put the fact that there's been a round requested. I mean, just gorgeous formatting here, I know, but who requested it and when. And once those results have been submitted back, they'll be in the database and we'll be able to see that, hey, the qu easy questioner is finished running and our solution won. Remember, the hard questioner asks you to guess the number 1 million in the range 1 to a billion. And since our OK player just always guesses one more than the last time, it's going to take a while before it fails. Did 100 moves. So we see the contest standings. That's the overall system. Let's now go in and turn on IdentityWare Proxy, which will let us finish this. So we've got to go to the IAM for Identity and Account Management, admin slash IdentityWare Proxy. So let's again open a new instance of the console. And unfortunately, we're going to see there are a few annoying steps that are necessary in order to keep people from selecting information unknowingly from other users. You're not going to be able to get Google to tell you a user's email address without the user knowing that accessing your app is going to make that occur. So we pull down the menu choice for IAM and admin, identity aware proxy, and the first time we do it, we have to enable it. And then it's going to tell us that we have to set up a uh, permission page, a page that tells the user who's doing it. So let's go to IdentityWare Proxy. We have to configure a consent screen. And that simply is something that's going to be shown when the user logs in so the user knows who's asking for my credentials and what are they going to use it for. So this consent, the OAuth consent screen requires a few pieces of information. Uh, if we were making this available to just one G Suite domain, we could say internal, but we're going to make this external. That's going to have to be reviewed before we can use it widely, but we can use it on small scale at first. The application name, um, programming contest. A logo that's optional. The support email for somebody who wants to ask any requests. We've got to put in a known email. Um, or it will use an email created by our particular solution. What information we're going to ask the user for. And by default, we're going to ask the user for minimal information, their email address and their user ID. We can ask for more information and it will tell the user that we're asking for that. So the user will know. Um, what domains? Well, we're going to have to tell it just the domains for our application. So let's go to our App Engine app. And we can see that its domain is serverless workshop engelkey.uc.r, etc. Then we're going to be asked for the home page link. Whoop. Okay. Did I press enter? Apparently, yes. And the home page is going to be at HTTPS, that domain. Privacy policy, I'm going to just use the same link, even though I haven't created one yet. And the terms of service are optional. So let's save that. Okay, now that we've created the consent screen, we can go back to the tab and refresh it. And it should let us go ahead and turn on IAP.
identity or a proxy. Okay, there we go. We can restrict access to HTTPS resources or actually SSH. We're going to restrict web access to our App Engine app. We're going to turn it on. And if we then try and go to our website, we're going to be asked to authenticate, and then we're not going to be allowed access because we haven't told it who, if anybody, can actually access it. So let's go ahead and show the info panel. Select that line and add members who are allowed to access our application. And we're going to add all authenticated users. And we're going to give them the IAP permission to be a web app user, to connect to our web app. That's going to allow public access. Our policy has been updated. It may take a minute to fully replicate, but let's go ahead and see if it's replicated yet by going back to our application and trying to request the home page again. We're being made to sign in. And it hasn't propagated yet that I am allowed to sign in. And this is going to take about five minutes. But once it is signed in, it will then pass through to our application and let me access the app and it'll know who I am. Okay. Come on. One thing I may need to do is go into the debugger console, which lets me empty my cache and do a hard reload. And there we go. I finally reloaded the page. I could have closed and reopened my browser to do this. Well, what did that do? Let's go take a look at our um, database and refresh it, and we should see a database of nicknames showing up. Well, the nickname will show up after I ask for a run. So I don't think we're going to have them yet. Right. But if I go ahead and ask for a run, Let's request the same function as before. OK, if I now request a new contest round, it's going to already know I'm Bill. And even if I was able to change this, which in a web browser, if you know how, you can override the read-only attribute, it will ignore my new change because of the way the code's been written. So that keeps people from behaving badly while still remaining anonymous. And again, our data, if we look at it now, should have a list of the nicknames that have accessed it. And that list is not going to have email addresses because we didn't need that and we don't want to store any more personal information than we absolutely need. Instead, it's going to just have that Google unique ID code. So nicknames. We should see a single nickname in there for the ID code that Google created that tells us that ID is Bill. All right, that completes this code lab. It lets us get through all of the major steps and build our solution. Let's do a quick recap. We created a distributed serverless system that has different portions that can be owned by different identity entities uh, the player, the manager, and questioners, each different groups, and it used quite a few serverless tools. We saw functions as a service, which is to say cloud functions, platform as a service, which is App Engine, reliable messaging, PubSub, and a NoSQL database and Firestore. And we optionally put user authentication as a service in front of it. 
Thank you for your attention and time. I hope this has been useful. Again, all these resources are available for you at serverlessworkshop.dev. And there you can either get my individual email address or you can use this alias to send us any kind of questions or comments you have. I appreciate your time once again and have a good virtual PyCon.